Hello everyone, Kent Bressler here. I want to welcome you to Kent's Kidney Stories. During our time together um, over these podcasts, I'd like to uh, discuss kidney disease. I'd like to tell you about my journey as a transplant patient, but also talk about dialysis, kidney donation, and just about anything else that might be of interest. Kent's Kidney Stories podcast endorsed and sponsored by kidneysolutions.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kent's Kidney Stories. Do not adjust your headset. Do not take a glance at the cover art or do not question yourself as to what you're hearing. Yes, you have tuned in to Kent's Kidney Stories podcast. No. I'm not Ken Bressler. His voice didn't change by some miracle. The COVID-19 vaccines did not alter his voice. This is Jason Nunez. Hello, everyone. So nice to, so nice to be here with you all. Uh, I'm the silent partner in the background with, 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 uh, with, with Ken's Kidney Stories. I'm the audio engineer. So typically, I'm the person who edits the episode before it's released out everywhere and, be, and, and releases out to you for you to hear. Uh, We're going to do things a little bit different this episode here. So as you can tell from the title of this episode here, uh, today's podcast episode will be in celebration, in commemoration, and the other shin is in recognition of Kent Bressler's 34th anniversary of his kidney transplant. So Kent himself will be our guest. We needed someone to talk to him, and that's where I come in. So that's kind of why I'm talking to you right now. So before we get to our guests, before we get to the man of the hour, let's go ahead and begin this episode the way Kent begins all this episode, and that's in prayer. So we'll go ahead and do so right now. I can ask you to please, if you're not driving, I can ask you to bow your heads. If you're driving, it's all by all means. Keep your eyes open and keep focused on the road. That's important. So here we go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this gift of faith that you have left for us. For this gift of faith helps bring us joy in the good times. And it helps carry us through the toughest of times. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Kent. We thank you for his brother, Kip. We thank you for his other brother. We thank you for the gift that was given to Kent, the gift of life, 34 years ago. I cannot imagine a world without Kent Bressler quite simply, because I don't know where I would be. So we praise you, God, and we thank you for him. And we thank you for all the blessings that he's been to so, so many people. That number is immeasurable, the number of people that he has been a blessing to. We thank you for him. We ask you to bless him as, as he continues on his journey, all the good work that he does with, with Kenya Solutions. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name Amen. of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All righty. Without further ado, hey, Kent, how are you, sir? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm, uh, as we discussed before I started, I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm choked up. You've got me <laughs> choked up and we haven't even started yet. So, I mean, <laughs> let's just say I'm ready and I'm, I'm just grateful for where I sit tonight. Indeed. Indeed. We're not even three minutes into this episode and I'm already crying. Yeah. So <laughs> if that's any yeah. indication of how this episode's going to go, Hey, there you go. Right. But you know, yeah. that's, that's just kind of the person I am. I'm not afraid to show my emotions. Me neither. Let's, let's just be happy that this is audio only. Cause I don't think anyone wants to see <laughs> my crying mess on this side of, on this side of the microphone here. So <laughs> me neither. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness for audio only podcasts. So exactly. one of the reasons that's, why I'm a fan of them. <laughs> that's why we chose it. That that's is why exactly. we've been doing so many of them. We enjoy them so much. That's right. We have faces <laughs> for podcasting. So, hey, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Uh, listen, Alrighty, Ken. Yes, listen this, it, this journey that, that I've been on mm-hmm. could not have taken place. Could, just couldn't have taken place without my brother Kip and my other brother Carrie. Yes. I still, unfortunately, Carrie 
had carried that feeling that he was going to be the donor Mm -hmm. all along. Right. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work out. Kip was a better match. And, and I can tell you that they decided amongst themselves that that's what was going to happen. Kip was going to do this. So, and, and thank God he was there and there was ever no question. I didn't even have to ask him. I told him what was going on. That was the end of it. Right. We were, we were on the, we were on the march and uh, everything was, well, I'm here today because of him. And I can't think of anything I could say to thank him any more than what's in my heart and, and my arms to, to hug him. He's very special to me. They both are very special to me. Along with my wife and kids. So there you go. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, you know, let's, let's go back. Let's go back okay. to that time. You know, let's let's go back to that time, and you've you've kind of shared bits and pieces of, of your stories, right? And I've kind of me, you know, how blessed am I that I get to hear all of these episodes before the world gets to hear them, right? So you know, I've I've you know our sixty plus episodes that you know we've been fortunate to to release. I've I've had an advanced uh, airing of these whenever I go through and edit these. So I've, you know, you kind of interject your story in different episodes as it relates to the conversation, but, you know, take us back here, you know, to that time, you know, we know that you had, that you endured about two days of dialysis or two dialysis treatments. Um, I did. And you received living donation from your brother, Kip. Um, take us back though. Let's, let's hear the full story. I, uh... You know, I look back at, you can do that, man. When you get to be 71 years old, you can just go ahead and look as far back as you want to. Oh, yeah. And as I look back, I can remember early on in my, in high school, I had, uh, in general, I had a lot of, I didn't have a lot of energy. You know, I, I could, I could complete functions, but uh, I couldn't, uh, I didn't have a lot of energy to play sports and all of that, but. I really didn't. I really didn't have that joy to veer that 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 feeling of of being whole at that all through my early life. Didn't know the reason for it, but now I can look back and tell you what the reason was. So in 70, 1970, I was drafted, went into the army, and I had mm. uh, yeah, I had physical. Of course, you got to do a urine test for physical. And I happened to hear in the room, I happened to hear the medic say, uh, the guy was doing the testing, he says, well, Bressler's got, I heard him say to another person, Bressler's got uh, some protein in his urine. That's all he said. And uh, didn't think much of it at the time. Uh, sure. Wasn't, wasn't trained at all to understand what protein in my urine really was. All right. But then... I said, well, does that, does that get me out of here? And he says, no, it gets you right in. We're not going to worry about it. And that's pretty much what happened. I went in and served two years and came out, got into, got into college, wanted to be an RN, and uh, was in a biology lab. Now, there's a test called uh, Bence Jones test. They, I don't even know if they do it anymore. <laughs> but you take a couple drops of urine, put it in this reagent, and if it foams up or has a little reaction whatsoever to your urine, you have protein. It measures the protein in it. And it goes from like a trace all the way up to uh, four plus. Well, mine was three plus or better. They call it four plus. The instructor told me, he said, you know what? You need to go see the doctor. You really do. And that's when I, I went to see the doctor and his, his response was, well, really, you know, Lots of people have protein in their urine, and I think what we'll do is, since you're going to graduate next year, let's just kind of keep eye on it. Uh huh. And remember that saying I tell you all the yep. time. I tell you, let's yep. keep eye on it. Yep. That and waiting are not in my vocabulary anymore. Right. And I know back then what I know now. I wouldn't have waited. So anyway, long was I go, got along with it. Uh, went through, got a job, and started working at the VA and. I did the physical at the VA and they mentioned to me, you know, your blood pressure's 130 over 90. Uh, you need to, you know, kind of look at that reason. You got some protein in your urine. 
And so I said, okay, so what do we do about that? And uh, the physician said, well, well, we'll get you a doctor here in the VA because you're a veteran and we'll, we'll just follow it. We'll see what's going on. And consequently, a few years down the road, I'm going to say roughly five years after that particular initial input into the hospital, my physical, my blood pressure went, went from that 130 over 90 to 200 over 110. And the doctor said, listen, this new, the new doctor, he said, listen, I want to send you to San Antonio. I want to send you to uh, Dr. Mulgrew. Dr. Mulgrew is a, uh, is a great uh, kidney doctor, and I want you to see him. Mm -hmm. Well, I met Dr. Mulgrew, and uh, he, he did the biopsy on me. He told me, he said, we need to biopsy because no, no 34-year-old man should be running around with protein in their urine. So you can see 72. I was, I was 22 years old, and in 1984... I was, you know, 34 years old. So that span, I had kidney disease that whole time. Wow. Okay. And I was a nurse. I knew I had it and I knew what was going on. I understood the whole process, but nobody ever really challenged me to what, what my options were. I knew dialysis was in there and I knew transplant from my age, working with kidney patients in the hospital. And I told my wife, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to do dialysis. So we got to figure a way out. Anyway, Dr. Walgrew did this biopsy. And I remember distinctly, it was in 1984. And uh, three years before the transplant. And did the biopsy. And I had a hemorrhage afterwards. It was kind of a, kind of a, it was a, it was not a good situation, but I did okay. So two weeks later, I went into the, to see him. Now, mind you, we're in the Metropolitan Hospital. Nobody will know where that is. That's old downtown hospital. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in there. He had a, yeah, yeah. He had an office there. Okay. It's still there. But his office was there at the time. So we drove all the way downtown there and sitting in. I mean, this guy saw I don't know how many people he he had in his practice. It was amazing. I mean, there were people going and coming and coming and going, and, you know, and we sat out in the hallway. Pretty soon he came out to describe Dr. Mulgrew. Mm -hmm. His glasses were down on his nose and he's, you know, balding and he, he, he very quick. And he, he comes over and he, sit, he, he tries to scoot us away, separate so he can sit down. He said, move a little bit. I want to sit between you. Mm -hmm. And he said, and this is a, a direct quote from him. He said, I have some really bad news for you. And uh, I want you and your wife to understand that what I'm going to tell you is truthful. And uh, I'm not, I don't have the courage to say it twice, but you have a very severe disease called fo focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Hmm. And I said, what? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I beg your pardon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, okay. And of course, Kathy was just sitting there going, yeah, blah, blah. Here we got two young girls at home and, and we're right. raising them. And uh, he said, yep. Yeah. He said, you have, it. we did the biopsy. We sent it off to the university. Then the university sent it to, to uh, John Hopkins and they diagnosed you with FSGS at the time. And I said, well, what is it? He said, he said, it's a very, progressive, in your case, a very progressive uh, kidney disease. And at, it's, it's, he, he said it's like ha having hardening of the arteries of the kidneys. It's oh, a fat that's attacked both of your kidneys. And I said, well, what, what can we do about it? He said, well, I'm going to suggest to you that we do a transplant. <laughs> and I, said, <laughs> I said, I said, okay, we do that tomorrow. Or yeah, I can remember the conversation. It was like, it was, just yesterday, he said, no, he said, we got to do some testing, but I don't do, think you'll do well on dialysis. And he said, I really don't want to put you on dialysis. Let's get you a kidney. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I said, I have two brothers. And he said, okay, I'll need their, I'll need their phone numbers. And he literally called them and told them my condition and what was going on. So Dr. Mulgrew made the phone calls. Dr. Mulgrew made the phone call to both of my brothers. Wow. That was not in the day of cell phones. 
well, to me, that's surprising. Yeah, you know, very surprising. My, my experience is, you know, talk to your family. <laughs> yeah, they no. just kind of put back on me to yeah to do that. Yeah, but he, he we were. I'm gonna tell you, we're still great friends. I mean, it was it was nothing special, right? But he wanted. I'm nothing special at all. But he he just felt that he wanted to talk to them. He's, you tell them, and then I'll be I'll be giving them a call, and that's what he did. There were no questions asked. From my understanding, he's still practicing, correct? Absolutely. Wow. And I, I shudder the day I, you know, driving 60 miles round trip and you're raising kids and stuff like that. I, I was with him for about six years. So he got me through the roughest part of my illness mm-hmm. after the transplant. And then we had another fella come to Kerrville and he said, why don't you go to him? It'll, it'll save you some time and some effort. You still, you know. You can still call me and I'll, I'll stay in touch with you and everything. And that's what we've done. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, fast forward to, uh, to a transplant here. Yeah. We were in uh, what was then called uh, Humana. It was Humana hospital in San Antonio, which is oh, now wow. Methodist, Methodist specially was, and uh, uh-huh. Dr. Benowski, who's retired and out in Montana somewhere, did the, did the surgery and Mulgrew took care of me. And Mulgrew took care of me for the rest of the time at post-transplant because he's, uh, he's a, a transplant nephrologist. And uh, he actually is a, a fellow who does all of the, the uh, transplant uh, immunosuppressive therapies on people. He, he, he would, you know, medicate them and get, get them adjusted on mm-hmm. heart patients, liver patients, anybody that they were transplanted. He was the go-to guy. Did a lot of, a lot of work with Methodist and went on down the road. He, he's, he's been really a, a blessing to me. Great doctor. Anyway, I, I, I remember being in, uh, getting ready for the transplant itself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, the, the, the very night, bef- no, the week before, the week before we were, my brother and I were both in the same room and they were doing 24, 24 hours, uh, on 24 hour urines on both of us. All right. Now being in the same room and the, your, your urine's in the bathroom, right. Mm-hmm. And the nurse takes that or the aide or whoever takes care of your, I wasn't putting out much urine. Right. But mine was full of protein. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, they came in the next morning after the test and, and uh, the surgeon came in and says, we, 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 can't, we can't transplant Kip. He's got protein in his urine. And I, I said, he can't have protein in his urine. He didn't have any to begin with. And right. just like out of the clear blue sky, here comes Mulgrew in. And uh, they tell him, you know what? He's got protein in his, Kip's got protein in his urine. Now he said, somebody dumped Kip's urine in, in his urine. I'll bet you anything. So they backed off and did a 12-hour urine just on him. And he was negative. So that, Wow. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, shocked. I thought, oh, gosh, here we go. And so Kerry was in the wings, thank goodness. But uh they said, no, he can't. There's no way. And, sure. Uh, and so there was the Mulgrew effect again. I had never heard that story. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So, you know, yep. it could have all been just For put not. to the side just on, yep. you know, human error. Right. Yep. Yep. You know? And wow. I, I was so sick, Jason, I was so sick. I didn't care. All I wanted to know all I wanted to know is where am I going to get this kidney? My right. creatinine, my creatinine was 17. Wow. I don't know if anybody understands that concept, but 1.2 is normal. Mine was 17 right. when I entered surgery. My 17. Gosh. And I had my heart had gotten enlarged. It, you know, it was starting. I had an ulcer that they had to treat before I could do the surgery. So much stress on me at the time, and my wife, bless her heart, stuck with me. 
And then to have two teenage, young teenage girls at home. Uh, so you can imagine what was going through my mind. I just, I really was so sick at that point. I thought, you know, it is to be with what God's got to, God's got to hand in there somewhere. He oh, will, yeah. he will, he will make it right. Something will happen. And sure enough, he said, Mongrel. <laughs> so, so the, so the day comes all this mix up with, with, you know, uh, Kip's urine and the protein and all, all that gets cleared. Yep. And, and where all systems go. Yep. Yep. And so he, he, he said, I'm going to send you home. And he said, I want, I want to, this is Mulgrew talking. He said, mm-hmm. I want to, I want to, I want to send Kip home. And then probably I want to dialyze you for, you know, a couple of weeks just to get, see if we can get your creatinine down. Cause Sending you into surgery at 17, although I've watched you all this time and you're adjusting, he said, I would like to just see if it will help some. And I said, that's fine. I, you know, I'm okay with that. So they put a central line in my chest and they dialyzed me one day. It was, I think it was on a Tuesday, the first dialysis and drew 10 pounds off of me. Wow. And, and I, I would, let me tell you what, I thought I was going to die that night. I thought I really did. I thought I was going to, I didn't think I would make it. I I was so sick throwing up and and my blood pressure was up and my head was pounding and Mm -hmm. my sinus was worse stuff shut. And I was, I was, I was just laying there hoping that I'd see the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you what, I prayed so hard. I just finally said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. You just have to, I'm wasted now. I'm yours. You just go ahead and work to make this happen because I can't go anymore. <laughs> and I remember distinctly that first dialysis that when I woke up as I was, he put, kind of put me, sedated me so that when he put central line in, you know, he, right. he, he didn't, uh, want me to have any problems. And when I woke up, I now get to this. This is a story that I tell quite a few people. <laughs> My dad is a funeral director. He, for 40 years, he was a funeral director in a little town in Nebraska. Huh. That's where I grew up. And he had, he, he embalmed people. I don't know if you, you know, that's, that's right. what morticians or funeral directors do to prepare a body for burial. And I, on several occasions as a kid, I watched him do that. I mean, it was commonplace. Yeah, I was in the embalming room. I think he's trying to groom me for to become a funeral director. Mm-hmm. Anyway, what ended up happening is I had, <laughs> I woke up and I looked over and I saw this machine and my blood blood going in that machine and, and going through it. I thought I was dead. <laughs> I, I, I literally thought I had died, right? I, I, I thought, oh, I'm being embalmed. Don't embalm me. And then I looked over real quick and I saw the tech over sitting over there. And he said, what are you talking about? And then I told him, and he started laughing. I thought he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to stop laughing. He says, you're going to make it. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> you're still alive. But that was, that was an experience. And then I went to a second one two days later on a Thursday and they tested my blood then on Friday morning. It was still 17. Hadn't done a thing to it. Then dropped my creatinine in one iota. So on Monday morning, uh, my brother had stayed. And on Monday morning, we went to surgery. Uh, and uh, I was transplanted. Yep. Wow. That I, I, I can relate with the feeling of 10 pounds coming off you. You know, I... I understand what that feels like, you know, and gosh, gosh, Kent, you know, I, there's so much of that story that I, that I myself hadn't, hadn't heard. So, you know, again, how blessed am I to kind of be able to kind of hear these and just kind of know, you know, what you've endured. I, 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 I have a, a place in my heart for people on dialysis. Oh, I don't definitely. consider myself to have been on dialysis. I experienced it. I know what it's like, right, right. but not the long-term dialysis. I, I don't, wouldn't want to wish that on anybody, first of all, yes. but I, I really respect and I, I love, I, you know, we work at Kidney Solutions. We don't turn anybody back. They're on right. dialysis. We'll take any, anybody that wants help, we'll, we'll work with. 
Yes. And I, I, I can attest I, to that. I, I can attest to that, Kent. I've, you know, you and I have had conversations about, about folks that kidney solutions help. And when, when you say that you will help anyone if they want help, you know, I believe that 100%. That, that, <laughs> is, not, that is not a sales pitch. It's not something to, you know, anything to that effect. It is the absolute truth. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I feel like, you know, Kidney Solutions is a worthy, worthy organization to help and to put my support behind with, yeah. with you, you know, the talents that, you know, God has blessed me with. It's a, it's a very worthy, uh, very worthy organization. I wa- wanted to say one thing too about, I had forgotten uh, along with this early, early story after the biopsy, I want to get this out so people with FSGS can understand it. Yes. Um, Dr. Mulgrew told me, told both of us at that time, he said, that, that's, I want you to understand that if we put a kidney in, your brother, brother's kidney or any kidney, the disease process that you have is known to come back and attack that kidney. And that's exactly how he said it. It's known to come back and attack the kidney. In other words, it'll do the same thing that's happened to your two kidneys, your native kidneys. It will happen to, could happen to the uh, transplanted kidney. Now back, now that, you, that was back in 87. Okay. That's 30 some years ago. And when he said it, there, has, there was not a lot of research, ongoing research into FSGS. They knew it existed, but it wasn't anywhere near what it was, is, is coming to be now. But still, we know so little about FSGS. Right. But you will have, if you have FSGS and you have a transplant, there are always a risk of it returning. And it doesn't have to return early. It can return at any, any time in the ballgame. At anywhere along the along the line, it stays with you, and and I've known people that have had it transplanted and lose it within two or three days from the illness, and some of them in hours, and I've known people that are out five, six, seven, ten years, and it comes back in rejection as as FSGS. So I have lived with that, and if you're listening to this, and gosh, I hope you are, and you've been diagnosed. I don't want you to be fearful. I want you just to understand that it's a possibility. It's not going to happen. It's a possibility. So make really sure that you understand that they have treatments now for rejection that can help. All right. So not having a transplant is not the answer. You have have to have that transplant to live. All right. Or you're going to be doing dialysis. There's only two choices. And as Jason knows, the third choice is not very good. No, that's not the choice anyone wants to go with. So you do transplant, you do dialysis, or you die. And that's probably, and have arguments about that all the time, but it's true. I don't know what any other option. No. So consequently, I've been blessed, totally blessed, because (laughs) of a great family. My family has been fantastic. I've been married 51 years to a woman that was my childhood sweetheart. Now, how can you go? How can it get any better than that? Tell me just how many, how many people do you know can be married to somebody they love for that long and have her stick with you, literally raise kids through the toughest time when your, your husband is as sick as, a dog and probably I wondered at some point in time, she thought I was going to make it. It, it, I'm sure it, it crossed her mind on several occasions. And I, I can tell you how sweet she is. I want to, I, I can remember this is the probably, and now I can look back on it. I think it's the funniest thing I ever, it wasn't funny at the time, but now I look back on it. Right. It was around Christmas time. And, and we were, she wanted to go shopping. Kathy wanted to take the girls shopping. And I said, oh, good. And so I drove down. This is like, I don't even remember what year it was. Anyway, I dropped them off at the Crossroads Mall, right? And Kathy said, no, I don't, you've got to come in. I said, no, I want to go across to, I'm going to go across to, uh, uh, there was Best Buy. I wanted to go over there and look at 
TV sets and all this other stuff. And I said, no, no, no. She says, you got to come in with us. And she said, I'm not getting out of the car till you, you know, go park this because not. So we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And finally, I, she capitulated. I don't know why, but she did. <laughs> I took off and went over. You know, you go out, went up, went across the, the interstate, got it to Best Buy. And I was in there, I don't know how long. I got a couple things and then and, and wandered around in there. And literally went back to the car and took off and went back to Kerrville. Started off to Kerrville. All right. So here I am driving down the road on the way back home. And I said, well, Kathy, what did you? And when I said that, they weren't in the car. Uh Uh-oh. And I go, oh, no. And I literally could not remember where I had been. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I knew, I knew that we were in San Antonio, you know, I knew that. So I, I did a U-turn. I think we were, cl- I was close to that first Bernie exit and I just turned around and I went, I went back and as I was going and as I was going, I guess I was kind of like retracing my steps. I was, right. had a feel for it. And then I saw the sign that said crossroads and bang, I remember I pulled in, pulled in the, on the way to go in the parking lot. And there are those girls, all three, the two, my two daughters, Gretchen and Celeste and Kathy standing right in front where you pull in to go in the parking lot. And uh, the joker that I am, I was good. I didn't get a chance to say anything. She said, get out, I'm driving. <laughs> she, 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 <laughs> What, wanted to know what happened, where I was, and you know, that there was no cell phones. There's no way she could have got a hold of me. Right, right. Uh, and that just shows you what what kidney disease is all about. I mean, you you. I, I always said, okay, whenever you say it's what I'm going to do, I'm gonna, I'm going to. And the last statement is always going to be yes, ma'am. Whatever you say from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. Yeah, you're- <laughs> That's, you know, you're, you're right. You know, kidney disease, it's not, it's, it's a mystery in the sense that there's no bounds to what it will not affect. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, you know, p- people think kidneys, you know, what are those? What do they even do? You know, we only need one, you know, but that, well, what do they really do? But it's when you have kidney disease, it's, there's really, it's, it's not just one section of your body that's affected. It's all of your body in all aspects, really, you know, you even, even your mental, you know, your there's, there's oh, almost I- like a fog that enters your brain exactly what it is it is called that's kidney fog yeah what i said yeah yeah and that that fog is really confusing when you're in the midst of it and you you're it has you it's yeah it's really really difficult gosh well i i had i have i had another fellow that was really important in my life other than friends that we've had at church and the church was really close all of friends at church there's a guy by the name of gary norgan who is a doctor in nursing, has a doctorate and taught at Incarnate Word, and he was at, with me at the VA. And he guided me a lot. He knew my situation. He was kind enough to understand. And he had literally mentored me through this whole process without knowing anything about kidney disease. But he knew I was a sick man. And I owe a lot to him. And there have been so many people in my life that I, I can't even begin to talk about it. I, I, I don't even for fear that I'll forget somebody. All right. But in the, in the course of all of this, the course of all of this, had I not had faith in Jesus Christ, I know that I would not be where I'm at right now. It can't, it, it could not have happened. Amen. And I look at all the people that I've been working with in the last 15, 16 years, all the people that I've, come in contact with. It's been a joy to know that they are walking the same path I walk. And it's, I always get a little, I'm very humbled to know that I've gone 34 years, but I'm also kind of embarrassed. Why me? Why, why do I get it? And some other people reject and have two or three kidneys and some people are back on dialysis. That plays pretty heavy in my mind. But again, it goes back to the faith 
in Jesus Christ is who, who tells you, you know, fear for nothing. There's no need to fear of anything. And, and you turn it over to him and you, he pretty well got you. And here I am. So all the people that are around me now, they're even more special than the ones who passed and gone on. But I can't even begin to tell you the importance of having a mentor, having someone that knows what's going on, right? That's been through it. And uh, that's the most important thing I can say is that you got to have someone who's actually experienced it to understand what you're going through. And I think that's been a good thing for me to be able to do this. Uh, I'm glad I've been here for this long and hopefully for more time so I can help as many people as I can. And that's, you know, that that's one thing that I'm very thankful for because that's one thing that you do and that you do well is you, you help people and you, uh, you have really become uh, a mentor of mine. You know, you're someone that I can reach out to and you're someone that I can just talk to, you know, I can just talk to you about everyday things. And, you know, our conversations will eventually get back to our transplants and to our health and to, you know, how are you doing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, through, through all of this, you've really become a mentor to me. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the only one who has that viewpoint of you. Um, for anyone that's listening, I, I invite you to go to kidneysolutions.org and simply click on the recipients tab. There's about 22 pictures and names and dates of kidney warriors who have received a kidney transplant. You know, and these are real lives. These are real people. They're not generic names, dates, and stock pictures. You know, these are real people. I've spoken to these people. I know these people. I call a lot of these people my friends. And these are all, these are all lives that, that Kent has impacted through kidney solutions. But what most people don't know is there's endless hours of communication with each of these people. And each of these people are unique. You know, everyone communicates differently. So in cancer person, they will communicate based on what works for you. If you prefer to, to send and receive text messages back and forth, that's what he'll do. He's not just a one-way person. And, you know, with me, he really, you know, Kent, you really helped me a lot through navigating the, the transplant process. And it's that assistance is priceless. It's priceless. And you, you've, you've impacted many people in the same way. And I thank God for you. I really, really do. Well, I thank God for you too. I told you, you're, my, you're the, the, the only son I never had. <laughs> right? Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> the way I wish the, 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 the son that I wished I had had. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was just thinking that as you were talking about the, the joy of transplant. Mm hmm and I, I, I see on Facebook, I uh, don't get on as much as I would like to, but I see in the chats that Jim Myers, my friend, good friend Jim Myers, oh, yeah, he's constantly Jim. throwing things out there. I mean, this guy is a phenomenon. He he's is. an amazing, amazing guy. And, and a true friend. We both, we both were fortunate to get the, uh, the Salvic Award from NKF, and, and we've worked together at a. AAKP, and all of this time that he spends, it's not lost on me, but one of the things that's really important here is that we have somebody like Jim doing that, all right? Armand Halter is another one. Curtis, there's just all kinds of people. I could just go on and on and on and on, but I don't want to do that because I'm going to forget somebody. <laughs> right. Right. But I, I really do appreciate the fact that I got to work in a, in a facility, in a little town of Kerrville, Texas, where I got to rub arms and shoulders with a, a lot of doctors. And I was able to work with a lot of nephrologists, train them in the hospital setting to, you know, in the challenges of the computer and, and you know, quality assurance. But 
the most important thing to me at that point in time in my life was the fact that I had kidney disease. I still had it. And I wanted people to know how important transplant was. I really didn't want them to get hooked into this idea that you got to go to dialysis first to be in the transplant. Yeah. I just don't believe that's there. I still don't believe it today. Dr. Mulgrew had still doubted me that that's not the case 30 years ago. And it's becoming more prevalent. I think preemptive transplant is the root. And I'm not saying dialysis is bad. That's not what I'm saying. You have to have dialysis if you need it. But is there a, a section of your life where you know you have kidney disease where you can get a transplant before having to go on dialysis? You bet there is. Right. You know there is. And you would have loved to entertain that had you known what you know now, right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. All right. Thinking back to what I know now, certainly. Yeah. And I know Jonathan, same way. Right. But the old saying is, you know, if you're in a situation where you can, you're after a, a kidney to save your life, you take the first one that's offered. You never turn down a kidney. You have the option, but you better have somebody that you can confide in, like your physician or a mentor that you can go to to discuss it because you sure don't want to lose an opportunity to get a kidney. So many people, was that 13 people, 12, 13 people die? Which a gym day. was there? He'd tell me right, what was right. <laughs> 13 people that die a day waiting for a kidney? Right. Come on. There's something wrong with that picture. Yes, indeed. And that's, you see, those are conversations that, you know, we've had me yep. up to my transplant. Um, I remember you would, you would always kind of fit that in somewhere as, Hey, between now and then, if you get a phone call, you know, you do not, you do not give it up. Nope. So, you know, and again, that's, that's that priceless, you know, advice that I would never know otherwise. Right. You know, trying to navigate this journey without someone who's, who's on the other side of it, who already knows, um, you know, that's kind of why I say, you know, the, the, the help that you give is priceless. It's priceless. But what I want to hear about Kent is, uh, is uh, your recovery. You know, I, I want to hear about your recovery from your transplant. Well, you know, this recovering is uh, the transplant itself is the easiest part of it. Sure. Right. It's a blink of an eye for us, right? Exactly. <laughs> we just lay there. Absolutely. I mean, hello, goodbye, and we'll see you in a little while. And then that's exactly what it was like. Yep. But the key to the thing, the whole process is longevity. And it's not in years. It's, it's spelled in how well you take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, just because you have a transplant doesn't equate into being healthy. You have to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. And it, you know as well as I do that if you have a, a, what we call a comorbidity or, or something like a diabetes or you know, some other type of chronic illness that causes kidney disease, you got to take care of that before you can take care of your kidney. And if you can't take care of that, you have great difficulty. Right. My point being nothing ever stops when you have a transplant. Your life's going to go on and things are going to happen. I can tell you that I've had a stent put in my heart. I had an aortic aneurysm that was repaired. Uh, it, it was nearly ruptured. And Dr. Venus here in little old Kerrville, Texas, did what they call a, 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 an endo procedure and uh, saved my life. All right. I could have lost a kidney. I could have lost a kidney. But because doing this endo endovascular procedure where he went up through my groin and, and did it instead of opening me wide open and cutting the blood supply off to, you know, other, other organs for a while, he saved my life. He saved my kidney for sure. And I've had other, other things. I have skin cancers galore. Okay. Over 200 that have been excised or burn off the, the I've had squamous cell and basal cell and that gout. I've had episodes of gout that uh, would just, <laughs> I, 
Don't get gout. Try not to. If you get it, boy, get it treated right away because it's a pain. Migraine and headaches to the max. If you have gout, Kent is someone that can help you because you yeah. had some experience with it. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, I, I laugh now because I haven't sure. had it. I've kind of outgrown it, sure. right? Yeah. I've kind of outgrown it, I think. It, and I've had it in almost every joint. Wrists, ankles, knees, my elbows. Uh, at one point in time, Big toe, that's where everybody says, well, gout's just a big toe. Well, it ain't either. It could be anywhere. So, so, so yeah, skin cancers, you got migraine headaches that tormented me for years. And that was a lot had to do with the medication adjustments. You go through constant medication adjustments. Now I'm on one drug, one called Sandimmune, and I've been on it for 34 years and prednisone. Okay. Now they take two plus several other medications, but the key is to get those medications regulated and then try to get them reduced as quickly as you can. You'll never go off of them. You're always going to be on immunosuppression, but try to get it at the lowest dose possible. Okay. And I think my recovery, I had a leg up on my recovery because I was an RN. I knew what it meant to take care of yourself. That's right. Yes. All right. I worked with chronic Leo patients. I saw diabetic patients who had difficulty maintaining. I have a very close friend who lost a leg to diabetes. I and I'll tell you what, it is. I, uh, I know exactly who it is. I'm talking to it. That's right. All right. <laughs> and I think that is the key to this whole thing, this recovery thing. Right. Is knowing everything there is to know about your illness and how it's treated, and never given up. You could have given up, Jason. You could have been You could have been in a wheelchair. Not you, buddy. And do you remember at one point in time, you asked me at a meeting one time, can I still get a transplant? Right. And I said, that should be your goal. Not you can, that you will. Right. So... It, I think that's part of the whole, this whole process. There's so many things that's happened to me in these 30 years. Some of them good, some of them bad, but I think moderation is my, my, my penchant here. It's something that I, I just need to say, I don't want to forget that. There's nothing you could have or not have after you've had a transplant <laughs> except grapefruit and pomegranate. Pomegranate, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Everything you can do, you can do in moderation. So a, a 16 ounce T-bone, it's not on the menu. But a little four ounce filet, although it costs quite a bit more, is better. All right. And you can get into all the diets you want to get into. I'm okay with that. Fine. Whatever you think, you want to be a vegan, you want to, you know, you know, cut down on your meat. I'm all for it. But I can tell you that moderation has been my my goal in life to stay there. And that includes with with uh, everything that you do. Exercise, you got to exercise. All of these processes you have to do. You can't get somebody to help you. You got to be be doing that yourself. All right. And that's the most important thing is that exercise, I think. All right. Even it's so much as walking once twice, three times a week, five times, whatever. You don't have to be a marathon runner. Don't have to lift weights, but do things that strengthen your body and then stay, stay faithful. God has a plan for you or he wouldn't have put you here. And that, that's, that's my recovery. I don't know how you put it in a nutshell because it's been 34 years. And that's, that's actually a very good point because uh, the recovery is ongoing. It's not like All after, right. after say, six weeks, 90 days, you're recovered. You know, it's, it's ongoing. You can be recovered from the surgery, right? Yeah. You know, the, you know, the sutures, your staples can be removed. You can be healed. You know, there's a scar. There's a nasty, gnarly, cool-looking scar now, right? Yeah. You know, I'm tempted to show off sometimes, but I haven't yet. But uh, – <laughs> You know, but the, the recovery overall, it's, it's ongoing because it's, yeah. it, it's a continual process. You're on medication. That medication may change. It may increase. It may decrease. 
Uh, so it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing uh, process. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned walking because that actually brings me to another, another point that, that I wanted to talk to you about and that I wanted to give you, give you an opportunity to share with uh, our listeners. Um, I, I, I want to rewind a little bit to, uh, to August of uh, 2020. And oh. <laughs> there was, a, <laughs> there was um, a fundraiser, right? There was, yeah. there was happening. I yeah. believe it was with uh, AKP or NKF, one of the- Is it a- American Kidney Foundation, okay. American Kidney Fund. American they are Kidney actually, Fund. yeah, right. they had a 37 mile uh, challenge. Right, yeah. right. So it's the, the challenge was for the month of August to walk 37 miles by the end of the month, right? Yes. So please, you know, for our listeners, how many miles did you walk for the month of August in 2020? Over 240. You blew away the goal <laughs> by, by, <laughs> yeah, this wasn't a competition, but if it was, you won several times over. Believe it or not, there were people ahead of me. Oh, was it really? Wow. Oh yeah. But I can tell you what, they were marathon runners and stuff like that. They, you know, they were oh, training yeah, and stuff like that. They're exempt. <laughs> but you know who who really got me going in this thing was was Jim Myers, mm-hmm. and he he just told me he said, "Man, you do this and uh, it would be good." And I got it all messed up. I don't know. You know, I'm not much of a, a computer guru, but I had it all messed up. I didn't care. Once I started getting into that mode. Uh, I couldn't stop. I, it was like addictive. I was, I had to walk almost every day. It was feeling so good to me. And I ended up, I think, I think it was around 240 miles. Maybe it was two. T- I don't know what it was. It was over 200 miles. That was my goal. I keep resetting it. it was 37 to begin with. And then 188 and it got up over 200. <laughs> But I see it's coming around again. They're yep. doing it right now. Jonathan's doing. It. Yes, I believe. And, uh, uh, I believe Jim might be as well. Well, sure, he's going to do that. But right. you know what? I average, I average right on three and a half to four miles a day anyway, and that's good enough for me. And uh, I'll make a contribution to him. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. Do that again <laughs> because I think it's too taxing on my body. There is. Sure. You can't overdo it. Sure. Right. Yeah. And I think I didn't overdo it. I, I did. Okay. But it takes a lot out of you. All right. And I think conservation of energy is very important with kidney disease. I think rest is important. I think sleep is important. I don't sleep much, but when I'm tired, I'll rest. I don't, I don't try to work through things, right. Try to grind through it mm-hmm. because I think your body's telling you something. If you're tired or fatigued, you need to rest, whether that's at two in the afternoon or seven at night, all right? And if you can't sleep at night, you get up and do what you need to do. Right. So we kind of went around in a circle here as far as the process of, of getting there. We did. We did. We went from, I want to say, from start to way past the finish line with that. But that number of miles you walked last August, so that's, that, that, that's impressive, you know, for, you know, for someone like me, that's inspiring. You know, at, at that point I was, I was not even uh, a year post uh, my transplant, which uh, I am now, thanks be to God. And when I, when I started to see the post on Facebook about that fundraiser, I was like, oh yeah, that's what Kent did last year when he walked that insane number of miles. And I think about it, it's like, gosh, <laughs> Wow. Jim, I don't think, I don't think Jim Myers there, you know, he saw it all the time, but he, he, it is hard for him to believe. (laughs) He's he's such a close friend. He's such a, he's been a real inspiration to me. He's kept me, he's kept me focused. And when I got, everybody should have a mentor, right? Oh, I agree. I agree. Don't you think in your, in your travels and in with this kidney disease, not being an advocate, it's being a mentor. Somebody mm-hmm. I can pick up the phone and call who's at it, who's been through it, who's Someone's fighting it there. now. Right. Yeah. And they could say, what are you crazy? Or they can say, Hey, get a hold of your transplant team, mm-hmm. or you need to see the doctor 
Or what are you worried about that for? Right? Right. I mean, somebody that will who'll see you eye to eye at any time of the day or night and is willing to talk to you, that's a mentor. All right. And that's a person every kidney patient needs. And they can have several. All right. I wanted to make one point about that on the, on the, when you're looking on the web and you're seeing all these posts and everything and whatnot, you see a lot of things that aren't true. All right. If you're reading something that Mr. What's his name did in New York city doesn't apply to you. It has no application to you because you don't know his situation or her situation. Right. You know, your situation and your best source of documentation and help is your physician, your nephrologist, the, you know, or someone in the community. But you got to remember, you're different. What's good for Jonathan or Jason or Jim or Curtis or Payal, all right, it may not be good for you. Right. Search out the most important things in your life and do them well, and you'll do well. And the most important thing in your life is that you've been transplanted, and that transplant is a gift. The most important gift you'll ever get. All right? If it goes south on you, if you have difficulty with it, if you start having creatinine rising and all things are looking not looking good, you say your prayers, but just remember that mentor is the one that'll say, hey, pick yourself up here now. There's bumps in this road. Nobody said it'd be easy, and it dang sure isn't perfect. There's going to be change in your life, and it's never going to stop. You'll always make adjustments. Your body will make it. Your mind will make it, and you will make it if you believe in that. So that's what, I, that's what I'm hope that Kidney Solutions is doing for folks is getting them to understand that there's others out there that'll help them. But you got to know the facts. You can't just believe what somebody says. You got to know and trust that individual. Well put. Well put and well said. Be, before, before we wrap up, Kent, I want to make sure I give you an opportunity. Anything you wanted to talk about that, that I haven't touched on, just to make sure there were, you know, all things considered here. I think that the bottom of my heart, I really, I really want to live, but I know we don't live for here. If you're established now with a transplant or you're looking, just remember that God's in command. He's the one that has your best interests in mind. So go to him. Another thing is, is confide in your mentor. Let them know how important they are and praise them because they are the ones that can pull you through the fire. But all in all, I really want people to take care of themselves. You be your, this is a probably well-worn statement, be your own advocate, but it's so true. Go to bat for yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, I don't know who is going to do it. You're the one that can do it the best. I just think I'm, I have things going through my head. People just, I just cannot say enough about my friends. And I have a lot of them in AAKP, Aaron Kale, Paul. just a lot of people that I, I just don't want to start naming them because I'm going to forget, forget people. And I just want to say that there's enough, uh, uh, there's enough of us out here to help others. So thank you. Getting well, get your transplant and then help others step out and be a mentor. And that's really all, all I can think of here. Beautiful, beautiful Kent. Well, you know, once again, sincerely, from the bottom of my heart. And I'm, I'm confident in saying that I'm bottom 
from the bottom of the hearts of countless people. You know, thank you for what you've done for us, for our families, for our communities. Thank you for all the hard work, long hours that, that you've put in for what you do through your mentorship and through your friendship. Uh, thank you very much. We, we join in your celebration of marking 30, 34 years with your transplant. And we all say thank you to Kip and thank you to Carrie for being the man in, you know, the on deck circle, you know, waiting for right. the number to be called, you know, swinging that bat with that, <laughs> with that donut on there, you know, ready, ready to step in if needed. You know, thank you to Carrie. Thank you to Kip and a big thank you to you and, you know, to Kathy. And um, I want to, I want to thank, I want to thank Kip. I, I can't, like I said, you can't thank him enough. And he's, he's more than a brother and he, he has done well. So all the donors out there in the world just can look at him. He's done well. He's, he's 68, 69 years old, living with one kidney and he gave me his best. So donors, you know, it's just another area. My brother is top of the walk. Now, I'm going to do this, or do you want to do it? What's up? What's this? What do we say when we close up? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Okay. Well, uh, I'll certainly lead up to it, but this is your signature line. <laughs> and every, Kent's, every episode of Kent's Kidney Stories have en has ended this way for a good while since early on, right? Not from the beginning, but from early on. And I'm not going to get in the way of that streak. So I'll certainly lead up to it. But when it comes time, that's, that's definitely your time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so already everyone. So, Hey, uh, thank you all for listening. <clears throat> you know, this was an extended episode, but with every reason, you know, to, you know, commemorate, celebrate and recognize, you know, uh, Ken's 34 year kidney anniversary transplant. Uh, we've all benefited so much from this man. So, hey, least we could do is give him an hour on his own podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And from now, and from now on, just remember, keep breathing. <laughs>